tested. Uh, what we've seen the last few days, perhaps because of the holidays, is the number of people tested has gone down. So we want to encourage anybody with symptoms, flu-like, cold-like symptoms, please get tested. It's much better to identify this early, prevent unnecessary risk for your loved ones, family members, and others, and to get the treatment you need if you need treatment. Uh, we currently have just over 1,000 people hospitalized uh, in our state for coronavirus. And we also mourn the death and extend deep condolences to the families of the 3,901 Coloradans uh, who have died from COVID. Uh, we have over 4,750 people who have died with COVID, but 3,901 that have died uh, because of COVID. Um, we are also at over 84,000 vaccines administered. Uh, we are uh, and remain, I think, uh, the top four or five states for uh, vaccines administered per, per capita, per population. We're very proud of that. We want to build that lead. Uh, we want to be number one. Um, and as more Colorados receive vaccines, um, you know, we're, we're, we're nearing the point where uh, in a few months, by late spring, early summer, uh, the risk will be substantially lower. And as you know, throughout this process, um, my goal has been to save lives and to end the health crisis. Um, which is why the limited early doses, the earliest doses of the vaccine, we prioritize the frontline healthcare workers who work closely with COVID patients across the state, uh, the people that are needed for COVID response. And now already uh, we've begun the residents and staff of long-term care facilities like nursing homes, where there has been a significantly higher rate of hospitalizations and deaths. Uh, today, we are updating and entering in many parts of our state phase 1B to more closely align with the CDC guidance and to act to save lives. Uh, phase 1B uh, still includes moderate uh, risk healthcare workers, uh, home health, hospice, uh, dental settings, first responders, EMS, firefighters, police correctional workers, dispatch, uh, many of the first responders and COVID-19 response personnel that are key for the COVID-19 response. Um, this update uh, also includes in phase 1B, Coloradans that are 70 and older. So again, starting today, many areas of the state are moving to 1B. Some are still in 1A uh, doing their frontline COVID workers, hospital workers. But for those who, many areas are entering 1B, anybody 70 and up, any Colorado 70 and up uh, can now legally receive the vaccine. And I want to talk a little bit about the reason for that. Over 78% of COVID deaths in our state are people aged 70 and older. And now people aged 70 and older will have the opportunity to begin getting vaccinated, protected in the next few days. Um, it's likely, given the size of the 70 and up population, that this will take about four to five weeks before everyone on, uh, over 70 who wants it will have gotten the first dose of the vaccine. Uh, again, for some, it'll take three weeks uh, until they get the second dose and gain the protection. The first dose might confer some protection. So uh, we're starting that today, uh, given the supply expected, uh, obviously dependent, everything's dependent on what we get from the federal government. But we're expecting that all Colorado and 70 and up, uh, starting this week, uh, will be able to complete that uh, vaccination of 70 and up in the next four to five weeks uh, for that first dose. The phase also, while Colorado and 70 and up are receiving vaccinations, we're also working with different employers to do targeted uh, programs for, for essential frontline workers, continuity of state government, educators, teachers, food and ag workers, U.S. Postal Service, public transit, grocery workers, essentially the CDC list. Uh, we've added frontline journalists, a few hundred uh, people that are out uh, uh, sharing knowledge with people uh, in the field, but risking potential exposure to that, and also uh, direct care providers for Coloradans experiencing homelessness also to this phase 1B. So um, those are not, um, these are not mass groups. So 70 and up is, is a mass group. That means you're 70 and up, you can get it. Obviously it depends when it's available in your, in your hospital, uh, in, in a drive-through clinic. Uh, some areas of the state are still finishing up 1A for another week and, and before they move on to 1B. For a lot of these other groups that we're talking about, you know, teachers, food and ag workers, uh, we will be scheduling with the county health departments, with other providers, largely uh, employment-based, site-based um, clinics for that. Could be 
you know, mid-February could be the date for you if you work at this Safeway is, you know, February 15th. It could be uh, if you uh, are, um, you know, for RTD, uh, you'll have a date. It'll be coordinated where you can get it. Uh, and it might be, you know, February 26th. So, so those, those will be specific dates for specific workers uh, in a convenient way. But the sort of large group of the population that is now able to get it uh, in many parts of our state, and then, and then, as I said, some are finishing up 1A and going to 1B, is if you're 70 and up, you can legally get it. It depends on supply in your area. Uh, we will work to uh, hopefully cover everybody 70 and up who wants it. And let me just add, if you're 70 and up, you really, 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 really should want it. Um, the the and, and why we prioritize 70 and up, and I think you've you've probably seen this anecdotally, but I want you to see the cold hard facts. Um, the the likelihood if you contract the virus um, of this um, causing death is 500 times what it is for somebody in their early 20s. And while we lose people of all ages, 78 percent of those who we've lost to coronavirus are over age 70. So once we get through this five week period, uh, you know, a few more weeks for the second dose for some people um, that, that get it towards the tail end, uh, we really have the opportunity to reduce coronavirus deaths by almost 80% in our state and a similar decline in hospitalizations. That would end the crisis phase. Pandemic not over, people of all other ages still getting it, some still dying, some still being hospitalized, but we will no longer have that immense pressure on our hospitalizations. And, and just imagine for a moment here, while we've lost 3,900 people, I mean, imagine if it was a number 80% less, still a tragedy, still a pandemic, but uh, we can make a lot of progress towards ending that healthcare crisis piece as we complete uh, the vaccination of everybody 70 and up in the next four or five weeks. Phase two includes Coloradans that are 60 to 69. Uh, and also high-risk Coloradans that are 16 to 59. That means people with pre-existing conditions. There'll be more details about that later, but there's a set of pre-existing conditions that the CDC uh, puts out. Um, it'll be the equivalent of having you know, a doctor's note. You have, for instance, diabetes, you're uh, 28, you're at a higher risk. But all Coloradans 60 to 69 for phase two, and uh, anybody 16 to 59 with pre-existing conditions, little uh, point on that, that might be extended to 12, age 12 to 59. There's currently clinical trials for 12 and up. It's not approved for 12 and up yet, but that could happen at some point. Currently it's age 16 and up. Uh, with these updates, all depending on the steady supply of vaccines from the federal government, we're anticipating that we'll get through phase one in spring, phase two by late spring, early summer, and then the general population uh, in summer. Uh, and that's everybody who doesn't fall into one of those categories. It remains critical that any frontline healthcare workers in 1A who have not received the vaccine sign up and get vaccinated. There are some areas of the state where 1A has not yet been completed. It's being completed in the next few days. We will continue reviewing any guidance from the CDC, update these phases accordingly. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to the day where everyone who wants a vaccine can get it and we can embrace our loved ones again, celebrate life's special moments with one another, starting with our age 70 and up Coloradans who are at greatest risk of hospitalization and death for this virus. Uh, the vaccine is now available legally to uh, everyone age 70 and up in your area. Again, they might still be completing the healthcare workers uh, and, and that could take a few more days, but in some areas of the state that is beginning right away. Uh, the second thing to talk about today, and we have our top experts here, and there's a lot of national and international interest in this. Um, scientists in our state identified the first confirmed case of the COVID-19 variant, the UK variant in Colorado. The individual is a man in his 20s who is working uh, in Simla, not recently traveled. He is currently receiving, he's currently recovering in isolation, mild symptoms. Our public health officials are working diligently to identify anyone else who may have been exposed and any other potential cases to test them to see if there's a chain of transmission with regard to the variant. And as I said, this is unlikely to be the, the, first, uh, the first person with the variant here in, in, in the United States. There are likely a, a many, particularly in Northeastern United States, but I'm proud that we detected it here in Colorado as quickly as we did. It speaks to the incredible work of the exceptional scientists and staff in our state lab, like Dr. Emily Trevanti, 
who's here with us today. I want to thank them for their commitment to helping keep Colorado safe to really increase testing capacity, the sophisticated system they've put in place. There's a lot we don't know about this variant. And scientists here in Colorado, and of course in the United Kingdom, are studying and monitoring exactly how transmission works with this variant. It's not uncommon for a virus to mutate or change. In fact, COVID-19 has had many, many, many mutations. Um, there has not been suspicions that other mutations have led to differences in transmission rates, but there are many, many transmissions out there. And early evidence seems to show from the United Kingdom that this particular mutation might spread more quickly. But at this time, there's nothing that indicates that this would cause different or more severe symptoms. Uh, but if it does transmit more quickly, obviously if more people get it, it means more people hospitalize. The CDC uh, and scientists in England, where this variant uh, is at least first detected, believed to originate, continue to emphasize that it's the very same things that we need to do to slow the spread of the virus. Wearing a mask, staying six feet from others, avoiding gatherings with those outside your home, and washing your hands regularly with soap and water. If a mask, a mask, the, the, the data shows a mask is about 50 to 75% effective. As we talk about the vaccine, 95% effective, we have a very easy, simple, uh, low cost, uh, 50 to 75% effective vaccine today. It's called a mask, wear one. Um, and if in fact this variant turns out to be more transmissible, it doesn't mean masks don't work. It means that masks might be 40% effective instead of 50 to 75. Still, uh, a effective way to reduce the spread of the virus and protect yourselves. Stay at least six feet from others, avoid gatherings outside your home. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Le Dr. Emily Trevanti, the scientific director of the state public health lab to talk about uh, really the world-class work being done in Colorado State Lab, a lot of focus internationally on uh, us being the first to find this variant. And she's gonna talk about how they did it. I wanna thank Dr. Trevanti and her team for their uh, work to identify the strain first uh, right here in Colorado State Lab. Dr. Trevanti. Thank you, Governor. I'm pleased to be here today to fill everyone in on how we found the B117 variant here at the State Laboratory. At the State Lab, in addition to processing testing, we are constantly studying the virus, keeping a pace with scientific discoveries as we continue to learn about this novel virus. We have been tracking the B117 variant of this virus since it was first discovered in the UK earlier this month, around December 20th. We followed as the variant rapidly became the predominant strain circulating in parts of their country. When we say that the variant was detected, we mean that a new version of this virus has been identified. It has a distinct molecular signature or specific sequence in the spike or S gene. The process for discovering the variant started by doing our regular COVID-19 diagnostic test, the PCR test that many Coloradoans get by having a nasal swab sample collected. This routine test looks for the presence of three COVID-19 genes in a patient sample. Typically, if we find those genes, we know the patient is COVID-19 positive. A positive result for COVID-19 affection occurs when at least two out of three of these genes are found in a patient sample. The viral genes used in this test are the N gene or nucleocapsin, or 1AB, open reading frame 1AB, and the S or spike gene. When testing a sample of the B117 variant, only two of the three genes are found, the N gene and the ORF 1AB gene. The presence of these two genes in the sample does tell us that the sample is positive for COVID-19. Things get really interesting though when we start talking about that third gene, the S gene. The S gene is there in these samples, but it is, mute, it is a mutation. It makes it typically undetectable by the routine PCR assay. We call this the S dropout profile. It is a signature marker of this variant. Upon learning of the novel B117 variant, first detected in the UK, the associated mutation in the S gene, the state laboratory set up a screen to capture samples in which the N gene and the ORF1AB targets were detected, but for which there was no signal for the S gene target. Samples meeting this so-called S dropout profile are red flagged, and we know that this means that we need to do more investigation on these samples because it could possibly be this new variant. To investigate further, we do viral genome sequencing. We look at the entire COVID-19 virus genome using next generation sequencing technology to create a complete fingerprint of the viral RNA found in the individual patient sample. The state laboratory has a well-established genome sequencing program that uses a number of advanced molecular detection techniques 
We combined this lab information with information from our epidemiologists to help determine the origin of outbreaks and inform public health action. In the case of COVID-19, the state lab is using sequence to track the movement of COVID-19 across the state and throughout the pandemic. At the state lab, we are committed to conducting genome sequencing on all samples with the so-called S dropout profile to determine how widespread this variant may be in our state. To date, we've conducted sequencing on 24 of these suspicious samples, and our scientists have found two samples that contain mutations in the S gene. Another 12 samples are currently in line for sequencing at the laboratory, and CDPHE continues to look back at older samples as well as all samples moving forward for indicators of these mutations. The B117 variant samples that we have we were able to confirm with the CDC was from a patient that had a positive result in this initial screen diagnostic PCR test with a strong signal as indicated by low CT or cycle threshold values of 12 to 13 for both the N gene and the ORF 1AB gene. Upon genome sequencing, it was found to have seven key signature mutations associated with the B117 variant first reported in the UK. These mutations include a signature or missing piece um, in the S dropout profile, as well as six changes that impact the structure of the S protein. Additionally, a second sample, which is highly suspicious but has not yet been confirmed, was also positive by diagnostic PCR testing with CT values for the N gene and ORF1A in the low 20s. Initial sequence analysis on this second sample shows most of the same mutations associated with the B117 variant, but we're still working to complete analysis on this sample. I understand that news of the variant is concerning to many of us, but thanks to the advanced sequencing processes we have put in place, the Colorado State Public Health Laboratory was able to quickly detect this first example of B117 variant in the US, positioning us to take swift action. We are proud to be able to provide this critical scientific information to help the state make informed decisions. We know that understanding the types of COVID-19 present in our state will help inform the public health measures used to control the spread of this virus. And I'll pass it back to Governor Polis. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Trevanti. And I also want to just acknowledge your work at the state lab. Last I checked, you're in the 80 to 90 percent of tasks processed in one day. Uh, so congratulations. Uh, and, and even outperforming many of our uh, private contractors as well. Uh, we are generally across the state somewhere in the 60 to 70 percent in one day. Uh, the rest take two days, and, and then there's a few contractors in a few parts of the state where it might take as many as three, but the state lab is leading the pack. So you're, you're over 80 percent one day turnaround on testing, and you're one of our biggest uh, processors of testing. So thanks for that work. And somehow amongst doing all that testing, you also have time to look for new variants. So thank you for uh, that groundbreaking work. I want to turn it over to Dr. Rachel Herlihy, our state's lead epidemiologist, to give us more information on what we know about the variant's presence in Colorado. Uh, and an update on the epidemiological response. Dr. Hurley. Good morning. Thank you, Governor. So our investigation and contact tracing efforts are ongoing, but at this time we are aware of one confirmed and another possible case with the B117 variant of the virus as described by Dr. Trevanti. Both of these cases are Colorado National Guard personnel who were deployed to support staffing at the Good Samaritan Society Nursing Home in Simla, Colorado, that's in Elbert County. Their deployment at the facility began on December 23rd. The nursing home has an ongoing outbreak of COVID-19. Cases of COVID-19 were first identified in the facility in mid-December, following routine surveillance testing in that facility. As part of their deployment to support facilities like this that are having staffing shortages due to COVID-19 outbreaks, National Guard personnel are routinely tested for COVID-19. These individuals were tested on December 24th, and that testing was performed at the state lab. And that is really how our lab came to acquire these specimens and do this testing that Dr. Taranti described. So right now we are currently investigating two possibilities for how these individuals may have acquired their infections. First, the National Guard personnel could have acquired their infections while working at the Simla facility. We'll talk more about that in just a second. And second, the personnel could have acquired their infection through other work or personal activities prior to arriving at the facility. Neither of these cases has traveled internationally in the weeks prior to their illness. So for that first scenario, we have detailed case investigation and contact tracing activities occurring at the Simla facility. To date, 20 of 34 regular, so non-National Guard staff in that facility and 26 of 26 residents in the facility have tested positive for COVID-19. Four deaths have been reported among residents. 
The testing on these individuals was performed at a different laboratory, so not at our state lab. Um, therefore, to determine if B117 variant is circulating in the facility beyond these two um, individuals that were for the National Guard, um, we have deployed a team to the facility that was done yesterday uh, to collect specimens from staff and residents in that facility. Additional testing will be performed today. Um, so specimens were collected um, and will be are being tested at the state laboratory. We do have some preliminary results from that testing from specimens that were collected yesterday. And so far, um, based on the testing that has been performed in that facility, we do not have evidence that the variant virus is circulating in that facility, um, but testing is ongoing. We have additional individual specimens that will be tested today and additional specimens that will be collected later today from the facility. I think it's impo also important to note that the National Guard personnel didn't arrive at the facility until December 23rd, and that was really long after most of the cases associated with the outbreak have occurred. Um, therefore, we're also looking into the second possibility, which is the possibility that exposure happened outside of the Simla facility. We have an extensive investigation underway to identify all contacts the cases may have had in the two weeks leading up to their deployment, as well as any other contacts outside of the facility they may have had during their deployment. That investigation is ongoing and we are exploring all possibilities. To slow the potential spread of this variant, the cases will be ordered to isolate for 10 days from their symptom onset or collection date. Um, daily uh, isolation monitoring will be conducted by our epidemiologists. The confirmed case is now isolating at home in Arapahoe County, and the other possible case is isolating at a hotel in Lincoln County. In addition, all identified contacts of these potential cases or this confirmed and possible case will be ordered to quarantine for 14 days from their last exposure with testing being performed on days 5, 10, and 14. Daily quarantine monitoring will also be conducted. Now I'll turn it back to Governor Polis. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hurley Heath. Um, and, and you know, uh, thanks for updating us on the ongoing investigation. As Dr. Hurley, he mentioned, it's being thoroughly investigated. We expect there'll be additional information in the next few days. I'm gonna now turn it over to our chief medical officer for the state of Colorado to answer questions that a lot of Coloradans have. What does this mean? What do we know about the variant? What don't we know about the variant? Uh, what do we need to do to stay healthy and keep those around us uh, who we care about healthy? What does it mean for the vaccine that we're all so eager to get? Uh, thank you for joining us, Dr. Franz, chief medical officer for the state of Colorado. Thank you, Governor, and good morning. Uh, of course, thanks, Emily and Rachel, for your strong work in identifying. Oh, good morning, everybody. Thank you. I hope you can hear me now. And uh, just thank you all for, for being here this morning and for Rachel and Emily's hard work to identify and now mitigate the potential spread of a new variant. Um, this variant, as you know, uh, has been found in the United Kingdom. It first appeared in the uh, end of September. And um, it was noted in the southeast part of England that the number of cases was rising quickly in that part of the country. And on further investigation, they found that this uh, new variant seemed to be the dominant form of the COVID virus in that community. From there, they, they, they have concluded that this new uh, variant can be transmitted more quickly and more highly. Indeed, uh, estimates of 50 to 70 percent increased transmission with this new variant. Uh, so what does that mean for us? Well, um, if you get COVID, of course, you can be without symptoms. 40 percent of people have no symptoms. Uh, or you can have symptoms of fever, a cough, and it's the same with this new variant. But it does um, potentially have the risk of spreading more. So if you're ill, instead of only uh, making two or three other people sick, you might actually spread it to four or five people if it's more transmissible. If it's more transmissible, that means that we'll have more cases in our communities. Those community number of cases will rise uh, quickly. And of course, with more cases come more hospitalizations, more ICU beds being filled, and the potential of overwhelming our healthcare system. Imagine, too, if a more transmissible form of COVID is in a nursing home. That means that it might spread more quickly within that nursing home and cause more people ill before we have a chance to get things under control. And what a tra tragedy that would be when we're just weeks away from uh, vaccinating people who live in nursing homes. Now, if uh, the, the other thing we're hearing, of course, is that this um, 
variant of COVID doesn't seem to be more deadly. So if you get it, you could be asymptomatic with it. You could have symptoms with it. You might be hospitalized uh, or need uh, specialty care, but at the same rate as the old COVID uh, um, virus. So it doesn't seem like it's more deadly. The worry, of course, is that um, if it's spreading faster and more people, ha people have it, even with just the regular rates of hospitalizations, this could be overwhelming for our healthcare systems. So I think it would be particularly sad if, at this time in the pandemic when we're working so hard at getting vaccinations in arms and uh, expanding our, our end game uh, to, 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 to see the end of this pandemic, to find ourselves in a place where these cases are rising again. That means all of us, as the governor has said, must do our part. We must wear our masks, stay six feet apart, uh, stay within our households, particularly over this New Year season. Um, we need to be uh, aggressive with vaccination following our prioritization as described today. Um, it appears that this vaccine, uh, we estimate, will be just as effective for the new variant as it was with the old. Um, we'll learn more uh, from the scientific work underway. But for now, uh, I think we should continue the hard work of staying safe as part of our preparation of the ending months for this pandemic, doing what we know we need to do to stay safe and uh, stepping up and being vaccinated. The larger number of people that become vaccinated, the quicker we'll have herd immunity and we'll control the pandemic. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Dr. Franz, for sharing how this could impact Coloradans. And because the virus, as we know, can tear through nursing homes and, and cause immense loss. You know, many nursing homes lost 10, 20% of their residents over a period of weeks, uh, higher risk of experiencing severe symptoms. We're requesting today, uh, given the detection of the variant in Colorado, that the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, allow us to temporarily pause visitation for nursing homes for the time being so that that population can be vaccinated quickly. That's already happening in nursing homes. But then, you know, in a month or two, when that um, population is immune, uh, there can be, they can finally, finally, it's been so hard um, for people of all ages, right? I mean, the economic uh, pain is felt by, by young people, but not only is the health risk felt more acutely by older Coloradans, but the social isolation, the difficult uh, emotional, social piece that so many residents of nursing homes have faced uh, after that vaccination already occurring immunity a month later, a month or two, finally, uh, you know, going out again, uh, going to malls, all those, all those things, but poker nights, um, you know, uh, all the, all the social aspects after the vaccination is complete. But for now, we want to, we want to vaccinate that population as quickly as possible. Uh, older Coloradans and nursing homes, it's already started. And uh, we're requesting that CMS pause the visitation uh, in, in, until we have that immunity very soon. And then a lot more of those social activities that, that make life worth living. Um, I also want to give a special thank you to Colorado National Guard members. From the beginning of this pandemic, they put themselves in harm's way to serve communities, protect the health and safety of Coloradans. They've helped set up and staff COVID-19 testing centers around the state. They've coordinated uh, mask and gown storage. They delivering vaccines. They're uh, on the front lines every day. Uh, and in Simla, the members were just, were deployed to help the staff the facility during an outbreak, where 100% of the residents of the facility tested positive, uh, and and the uh, the the person that contracted the variant ultimately ended up contracting the virus. Not necessarily connected with the uh, the facility. The timing, as we indicated, uh, likely earlier. There was already the outbreak there. Uh, we are doing additional testing. This new variant is just another reminder that there is a lot that we don't know about the virus, but there's also a lot we do know, namely how you can avoid getting it and increase your chances of not contracting the virus. Avoiding social interactions with people outside your home, keeping a distance of six feet, wearing a mask around others. And as vaccines work their way into Colorado, it doesn't mean life is back to normal yet. In fact, even the first Coloradans that received the vaccine still are not immune to coronavirus. It'll be another two weeks. They, they will be getting the, the very first Coloradans who got the vaccine, those very first uh, you know, COVID ward workers, uh, e even they are not immune yet. They will get another dose in a week or so. 
and then they will be immune in about two or three weeks, those very first Coloradans who got the dose. So this is the home stretch, the last leg of the marathon. People 70 and up can get the vaccine. We hope to complete within four to five weeks the first dose of the vaccine for 70 and up. Once the immunity takes hold, that's another uh, few weeks after that. Uh, we hope that there's a decrease in, in fatality, about 78% of the of those we've lost uh, in our state uh, to the virus have been over age 70. So the last thing we want to do, here we are, we're ending the marathon. You know I like baseball. We're rounding third base. Here we go for football. We're on the two-yard line. Let's finish the game. Let's finish the race. The last thing we want to do is trip and fall before we reach the end, and there's a lot of temptation. There's a holiday called New Year's coming up, um, and I want Colorado to see 2020 in the rearview mirror, but we want to make sure we celebrate with our own households in this very different New Year. And what we don't want is, is large parties and events that uh, could jeopardize your life and your loved ones and could set the state back by weeks. You will be able to uh, enjoy that after you've been vaccinated. Uh, it's really the end is in sight. So avoid parties, indoor get togethers with people you don't live with. Celebrate this New Year's differently with loved ones at home. Find alternative ways to ring in 2021 with families and friends using technology. You can watch the ball drop together online. You can go outside if there's snow and make snowmen or snow angels at midnight. That's what I used to do. You know, we used to pass our uh, New Year's in Vail when I was growing up um, uh, from, you know, age six to 26, but, you know, as a teenager. So what we do is we'd wait until midnight every year. And then we would all, me and the kids and the cousins would all go out to see who would be the first sledder of the new year. We want to see who would, who would sled first at 12.01 a.m. So I was the, uh, uh, proud to say I'm the first uh, uh, person to sled in 89, 91, and 92. Uh, first person to, to sled in those years. In other years, I was beat out by cousins and friends. Uh, but look, um, however you celebrate New Year's, do it with those you live with. Be safe. Um, we're nearing the end of this, and together we can get through it. This is really our last big hurdle. Um, if we can get through this without a spike, we're setting ourselves up for a strong recovery, health, economy in 2021. Uh, and I want to say thank you, Colorado, for your resilience, for wearing masks, for your sacrifice, for your optimism, for your determination to get through this, your generosity to one another. It's not been easy, but you're what makes our state so great. So be safe, have a happy and fun new year in a way that you can do it in a safe way, and we're happy to take questions. Hi, uh, this is Erin Prater with the Gazette in Colorado Springs and Denver. Just a few questions, if you don't mind. The first is I just wanted to firm up. Uh, I, I believe it was said that we had one confirmed uh, case of the mutation and one possible, but it was also said that the mutation had been found twice. So I just wanted to see if we make sure um, that we had one confirmed and one possible or see if we have two confirmed. Also, um, given that this new mutation is more transmissible, are current precautions enough and are current dial levels enough? And also, is there any update on uh, trials of the vaccine for kids younger than 12? Thank you. Let's go to uh, Dr. France and probably Dr. Herlihy to address part of that. Dr. Herlihy first. Yeah, this is Rachel. I can take that first question. Um, so we have one confirmed and one possible case of the variant in the state right now. And uh, Dr. France, any updates on the, uh, the additional trials? Yeah, and regarding what we might be doing about transmissibility, you said, and does it have a, an impact on the dials? Really what this just means is that we'll be keeping a close eye on the cases and the number of cases every day. If the variant becomes a dominant uh, form of COVID in the state and indeed is more transmissible, we'll see, a, we'll see a steeper uptick incline of cases as times go by and we'll need to react more quickly to help control it. And so right now we're in this good place where cases have been stable and down. And if we can stay in that space, then we'll be fine. Um, the, the issue, of course, will be if we start seeing cases come up and if our own sequencing finds that this is being driven by the variant, then we'll have to maybe act quicker and more broadly in our thinking. I don't have any other new updates when it comes to the trial itself for children at this point, but we would expect not to really have much information on the use of the vaccine for children until at least this summer. And the, the step the state, the state is taking today is we are requesting from CMS the ability to pause visitation in nursing homes 
as they get inoculated, it's happening right now, every day. It will be done in the next couple of weeks for nursing and skilled care facilities uh, and their staff as well. And then after they have that immunity, uh, a lot more full socialization and, and visitation. Sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, good morning, Governor. It's David Clue at Denver 7. Um, with everything that we've just heard, do you see this new variance as a game changer for your approach to containing the virus? And also, are you getting any indication that this will push the federal government to prioritize Colorado more for additional vaccine doses? Uh, so, as Dr. Franz indicated, we are looking at case numbers, right? And so we will we will react to case numbers, um, and it's really the same precautions that Coloradans need to take to avoid any of the variants of coronavirus. Um, as I said, if it turns out this new variant is more contagious, it might mean that a mask is, you know, 40% instead of 55% effective, but still, all the same precautions need to be taken. People should just be more diligent about taking those precautions as we find out how prevalent this strain is in Colorado, uh, forthcoming information in, in the following days and weeks. But we monitor case numbers every day, every moment. Hospitalizations, we're just over 1,000 Coloradans hospitalized from COVID. Uh, our, our North Star is not uh, exceeding our hospital capacity in our state. Uh, that'll be helped significantly as we inoculate everybody age 70 and up in the next four to five weeks. Uh, thank you, Governor. Charles Ashby from the Grand Junction Daily Sentinel. A couple of questions. Now you've greatly expanded the number of people who qualify for a vaccine in uh, in 1B. Um, given what uh, President-elect Joe Biden said yesterday about the number of uh, vaccinations and being doled out to the states, are you confident there's enough or will be enough to cover all those people? And for the scientists, um, how worried are you about this variant becoming mutating again and becoming a full-blown strain? And um, what conditions would it take for that to happen? There remains some lack of uh, uh, of um, uh, stability in the federal supply, and certainly some uncertainty there. But but from what we know today, and what we expect from our federal partners, uh, we believe that it'll take about four to five weeks for everybody age seventy and up to receive their first dose of the coronavirus vaccine. Um, it's certainly possible supplies could increase or decrease, but um, from our best uh, projections now, that's the expected timeline. Dr. France. Thank you, and I'd be happy to have Dr. Trevanti jump in as well. Those, those scientists who specialize in viruses and their, their normal mutations uh, tell us that it's usually a slow process and that if um, we were to be concerned that there was a mismatch between a vaccine and the current vaccine uh, vi virus that that would take uh, usually a number of years before it was a problem and so at this point i say we have time to learn more understand the science and uh, i think it's good news that some of these newer vaccine platforms the messenger rna platform can be quickly swapped out one piece of genetic material for another, at least from the time perspective of what it takes to make a vaccine. And so the, our ability in the next year to, to make changes to the vaccine, if needed, uh, is there. Uh, but we won't really know that for, for months to years. Let me also uh, add that uh, the vaccine is free and there is no copay. So if anybody is trying to charge you for what they say is a vaccine, uh, the chances are that is not a vaccine. We want to avoid uh, any problems with a uh, black market or false product before they even begin. Uh, that's not been reported yet, but I want to encourage, if anybody's trying to charge you, uh, that is not the real deal. It is free. There is no copay. Uh, if you're 70 and up, you can ask for availability at your local uh, hospital um, or community health clinic. Uh, they might still be in your area working through 1A, but, but they will be getting to 1B at some point very soon in the next few days. I can also add really briefly that, you know, we know viruses constantly change over time and we expect more mutations to happen with this virus. New variants have been popping up throughout the whole course of this pandemic. Some pop up and disappear without even being being detected. Um, and we expect, you know, this, um, this to keep happening and there's no necessary reason at this point to think that this one um, is any, 
any more concerning than another variant that may arise, and we will continue to perform the sequencing surveillance at the state laboratory to keep an eye on how this virus is changing as, it, as the pandemic continues to unfold. Hi, this is Mary Ann Goodman with Colorado Politics. Uh, one, the, my first question is about the uh, situation at Good Samaritan. The two National Guard uh, troops who uh, have been tested, were, were they the only National Guard personnel at that facility? Um, and is there a possibility that um, the one who's back in El Paso County can be bring back to a National Guard facility there? Uh, my second question is how many vaccine doses the state is in line for and how that compares to the populations in the 1A, 1B, and phase two groups? So I think Dr. Hurley, do you wanna take that uh, question on, 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 on the National Guard? Sure, so a total of six National Guard personnel responded and have been deployed to that facility. Two of them have tested positive. Um, one is a confirmed case of the variant, the other is a possible case of the variant. Um, so at this time, we do not have other members of the National Guard that have tested positive. Um, as I mentioned, case investigation and contact tracing is ongoing. And so any close contacts of those cases will be um, issued quarantine orders and will be placed in quarantine for 14 days. Um, secondly, Marianne, we're, we're, we, we only know for sure what we receive in our state, and we're happy to share those numbers. That's, that's a different team of experts, but the Scott Bookman has those. We have projections for future weeks, and, and everything we're talking about in terms of timeline depends on those pre projections actually being a reality of what we're getting each week. So when we're talking four to five weeks for everyone age 70 and up to uh, have the opportunity to get the vaccine, that depends on our projections of the supply uh, being met with the actual supply. Uh, we, we hope that happens, but it's certainly possible there could be logistical breakdowns at the federal level. It's also possible that there could be um, faster delivery. So, so there's some um, unknowns there that are that are out of our control about when we receive it in our state. But we're, we we always report on what we receive in state. We are working on a new vaccine. There is a vaccine dashboard. We're working on a new vaccine dashboard with even more information that will be updated uh, dynamically in real time. Hey, Governor, this is Jesse at the Colorado Sun. Uh, two questions for you guys. The first one is probably for uh, Ms. Trevanti. How long does it actually take to do that RNA sequencing to identify whether or not the variant uh, is, is in what somebody tested positive for? And I'm wondering if you guys can just talk about how prevalent you think the disease is. I know it's impossible to say, but obviously someone who didn't travel has it, so it, it's clearly in Colorado. And then the other qu question is probably for the governor. Uh, some counties are vaccinating people who are 75 and up starting tomorrow, but you're talking about 70 and up. So I'm wondering if you can talk about where that discrepancy is. Uh, so I can I can address the first part of your question. Um, so you were you were asking about, you know, how how long it takes to identify this uh, this mutation. So the first step is to actually just do the diagnostic PCR. Um, and that is sort of dependent on the number of samples that we get in and how um, how fast a lab can turn them around. Currently, the state laboratory is um, running a turnaround time just over a day on samples as they come in the door. So once we identify a candidate for sequencing, that process is a little bit longer and can take three to five days to generate all of the data necessary. Um, okay, we, we are going questions. to return right now to regularly scheduled programming.